All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Melissa Tui, and I'm the EdTech and Adoption Specialist here at Ozobot. We're thrilled to be uh, featuring three incredible educators from Hong Kong today, and they are going to share all about hands-on distance learning. Um, I believe that their school shut down before ours did here in the United States, if you're a teacher here in the United States, and um, they made some quick pivots to make sure that their students were making or getting access to really high quality and incredible um, STEAM education. So we're so excited to be featuring them today. Um, so we're, we'll go through a few housekeeping items. Um, this is our agenda for today. We'll go through some housekeeping items. We'll have a couple of polls just to see who's in the audience and what um, everyone's background is. And then we will um, uh, have a giveaway sign up. We are giving away three um, edu educator entry kits today. Then we'll introduce um, our three educators, Adam, Ryan, and Fred, and then they'll share all about how they were able to go one-to-one -one with their um, with their Ozobots remotely. So um, after that, um, Adrian, who's on our team, will also share about a new one-to-one -one program that Ozobot is offering for schools here in the United States, and then we'll move on to Q&A. All right, great. And now finally, on to our hosts. I am so thrilled to welcome Adam Hill. Ryan Krakowski and Fred Yu to this webinar. I'm actually gonna hand it over to them to introduce themselves because they know themselves best. And um, we'd love to know more about your experience and your background in education. And um, I'll actually um, stop the screen share and pass it over to one of you so that you can start um, going through the presentation on your end if that makes things easier. So thank you again for joining us. We know that it's your weekend in Hong Kong. There's a huge time difference um, between Hong Kong and the US. So we really appreciate you taking the time to share all your insights and expertise with us. So I'll stop sharing. Yeah, thank you guys enough for being here. <laughs> all right. Uh, should, I, should I share my screen? Sure, oh, thanks. Okay, all right. Well, first of all, thanks to Melissa and Cassie and Adrian for having us. We really appreciate it. We're very happy to be here. It's uh, just after eight o'clock in the morning, Saturday in Hong Kong. So good morning and good evening, depending on where you are. Yeah, and I just want to say that Adam Hill is the only one at school right now. You guys are very <laughs> early today, ready for this. So Fred and I are both at home. <laughs> there's reliable Wi-Fi, there's chocolates, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> okay, so good morning, everybody. I'm Adam Hill, and I'm a year four teacher, uh, originally from the UK, but I now teach in a PYP school, year four. I'm also the head of year. And let me just take this opportunity as well to really thank Ryan and Fred. They've been really driving this at our school and it's all down to them. I'm an enthusiastic class teacher who's really jumping on board, but they've been running it. So thank you both. Okay. Um, so my name is Ryan Krakowski. Uh, I'm a digital literacy coach at uh, VSA with Adam and Fred. Um, and I'm from Canada. I've been in Hong Kong for about 10 years now and really enthusiastic about you know uh, finding new ways to integrate technology so as you can imagine um this remote learning time was was a bit of a challenge what to think of a real you know great resource to use um for hands-on uh robotics and, and coding and so on um so fred fred and i spent a lot of time and uh yeah we were looking forward to sharing our experiences through that time exactly uh hi i'm fred uh, I'm, I'm the bilingual pyp digital literacy coach from uh, IB school in Hong Kong. And as a team, uh, we, I work closely with Adam and Ryan, so trying to push the school forward to more innovation projects. And I mainly teach year one to year five and also have some secondary students in our after school program. And we are really happy to be here and wish we can share more about our story. All right. Awesome. Thanks for being here, you guys. Okay, so we thought because we're talking about our school a lot and the learning that we're bringing, um, some school context would be useful. We're an IB school in Hong Kong, a through trained school from about five years old up to, all the way up to 18 with all the IB programs. Uh, we have a big emphasis on bilingual education. I see that somebody in the chat was asking about what a head of year is. Sorry for the confusion with different terms, um, but we have different we have multiple classes per grade level. Um, so we have six year four classes. Uh, many other grades have seven classes. So I'm kind of the leader of the grade. Um, we have approximately 1,800 students. We work in the primary section, which is about half of that. Um, but also it's such a versatile tool that this can apply to anybody. I know we've got a real mixed bag in the audience, but that's fine because it will apply to everybody. 
And we were impacted by COVID a lot earlier than most of you, um, right at the beginning, late January, I think it was, or early February. And we were actually on a school holiday at that point. A big holiday in Hong Kong and China and other parts of Asia is the Lunar New Year. So we were on holiday in different parts of the world, traveling. Many of our teachers were in China, visiting family and friends. Um, so it hit us during the holiday. So we had to make very quick preparations. Um, I don't really remember my holiday in Europe. We were just planning for this. Um, so yeah, really early on, I think as early as anybody in the world, we were hit. Um, so the last time I saw my students was January 22nd until recently, um, at the beginning of June for us and the end of May for secondary, we came back to school and that's been going really well. Nice. Yeah, um, we really want to start with how, uh, why we chose all about. So um, when we were planning the one-to-one -one robot program, we really had to put a few points into our consideration. So like how much budget do we have? How could we manage to distribute such a large number of packs to each family? How could we provide a fun and engaging learning tool which also has the uh, flexibility to adapt to different age groups? So we have uh, students from age five to age 11. So we looked and compared a few options, brainstormed what we wanted to provide to our students. Uh, eventually we decided to focus on the tools with better hands-on learning experience. So then all the ball came into our site, so which is definitely affordable and has a tiny little size that is really easy to deliver and store in either school in Hong Kong considering this living condition in Hong Kong is pretty small. And it's really easy for students to carry around, especially those younger ones. And what I really want to highlight is the unique on and off screen uh, coding feature that really brought lots of fun and great learning opportunities for students to create at home with or without an extra device. And I remember that was in March, and students have been stuck at home for basically two months and the momentum is kind of like going down and parents started to complain about too much screen time or this kind of like problems coming up. So you, you won't imagine such a good time to give out a game changer. I really think it was a wise move. Okay. Um, and leading off what Fred was saying there, uh, as we have students, you know, in different age levels, uh, every student is at a different point in their, um, you know, understanding of coding and computer programming. So we really needed something that was adaptable for all of our grades, um, where Ozobot's absolutely perfect for this because for our young ones, they start off with their marker coding. Um, and then when they feel comfortable enough, they move on to Ozoblockly. And, and Ozoblockly, you can't say enough about it, is a wonderful program. It has scaffolded um it's a scaffolded coding coding platform where there's different levels for different levels of comfort in coding um, and as you go up obviously there's more functions available for students to use uh, so it was really great to kind of meet the needs of all of their students um, co coding wise in our school um, yeah as also also about there's it's a really transdisciplinary um, you know device it can be used in many different subjects uh, ways that we've used it through our challenges here and just in, in school. Uh, we use it a lot for storytelling, um, you know, retelling a vacation, talking about, you know, a special time in their life. They, students absolutely love using the Ozobot to go and code and really um, show what the character was feeling throughout that time through the, through the codes. Um, we also incorporate Ozobot using little design challenges um, as we were on remote learning you know, students are spending all that a lot of time at home. So what better way to, you know, improve some functions at home or then to use Ozobot to do that, to do so and, and to do lots of little problem solving um, uh, problems using Ozobot. Uh, and, uh, and I want to say also like Ozobot, since we started using it, you know, generation one, there's been so many improvements. Um, the bot itself has improved greatly uh, from version one. The online community has expanded, uh, you know, the 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 resources that are out there if you're on twitter on youtube in their community um now with ozobot classroom it's really grown and uh really you can find ways to apply ozobot to just about every every area of education and yeah as 
Ian said the online community is really great and it's growing. Um, we've seen lots of great content on Twitter and Facebook and in other places. So that's another reason we chose Ozobot because of all the great things we, we saw. And most importantly, we've really made a conscious effort to bring more coding on robotics into the classrooms. So it's really to consolidate that and build on that and take it even further. Yeah, and, and like I said, we want to take our coding and robotics further. So we have big plans for the future. Um, but this was also about getting Ozobots into the hands of kids while we're away from school, while we were at home. Um, so we gave them two options. It's one, the parent could pick up the Ozobots from school. So, you know, it was never very serious in Hong Kong. You know, we could leave our home, we could pick things up from school. Um, so that was one option. And we also used the school bus routes um, to deliver the Ozobots to different families and different homes. So all the Oyster Boys went out in all the school buses around Hong Kong um, to drop them off and the parents picked them up from the buses. Um, so we were able to very quickly get the Oyster Boys to the students' homes. Yeah, when we are looking at the uh, creating the challenges, we did some research and when planning the challenge. So when we went through the online communities such as Twitter, YouTube, and also the Oyster Boys classroom, I found there was a uh, a really good resource for lesson library. So we got lots of inspiring ideas. Uh, also considering the COVID situation in Hong Kong, so students spend too much time at home, we really want our students to take responsibilities to help at home, even if it's just like, you know, on a mental level. So, um, and trying to get some fun learning experience. So eventually we decided to give scaffolded tasks from fundamental to challenging, from specific targets to open targets. So we want them to know even with distant learning, you can still do something fun and cool. Okay. Um, so how we introduce this, because you know, none of us were in school, we're all online and all, all over you know, Hong Kong and all over the world. Um, so we started off with videos and we made these uh, short one or two minute videos first, an unboxing video. We know students love going on YouTube and watching the unboxing of toys. Uh, and you know, how excited is it to see your digital literacy coaches creating their own unboxing video? So we made one for, a, for Ozobot. Um, and then we you know, created a video introducing them to the plat introducing to the bot, introducing them to the platform, all of the wonderful uh, task cards are provided um, so that they could start to work their way uh, and to understand how Ozobot works. Um, and then we made our challenge videos. So they kind of followed the same template, but uh, you know, lots, you know, great music and great visuals and to really hook and capture, um, capture the attention of our students. Uh, we shared all these through uh, our learning management system, which was Google Classroom. Um, and along with these videos, we included all of the resources and templates and everything that students would need to complete the challenges. Um, and we made sure that the challenges, you know, were low floor, high ceiling. Uh, they could reach the needs of all of our students. They could use the marker codes, all, you know, in year one at six years old, they could use the marker codes to complete the challenges. Or if students, you know, who are, you know, more comfortable with coding, they could go into Oslo Blockly and use some of the, the higher levels of uh, the coding platform. So, um, yeah, we, we, we thought this was the best way to, to, to put this out through online learning. And we felt that we reached yeah, the needs of our community pretty well with this structure. Yeah. All right. Okay, so next I'm gonna show you uh, how we lay out our instructional videos. So because we, we, we did this because we think it's, it's more engaging than just like giving out some, you know, text instructions. So we made this into a series. Uh, I'm gonna walk through very quickly. Oh, sorry, let me go back. All right. Is it, is it lagging? Mm, a little. Yeah. A little bit to start. There it yeah, is. A little bit, okay, all right. So yeah, so you, usually we have an opener. So this is our challenge three example. Uh, I'll just, all right, okay, yeah. So normally we use some funky and uh, happy music to get the vibe started. And uh, also in, this is section one, uh, sorry. 
yeah, here. So this is our section one, which has instructions and expectations. So we usually just summarize our challenge target into one sentence to get students to understand what is going on. And we also post things to consider, uh, put some tips, and also we have some reminders. All right. Yeah, so we have some reminders. And because this is challenge three, it's our first time to introduce all the Blockly. So we have a quick intro of all the Blockly in this video. Right. Yeah, this is it. So basically it talks about the interface and all the buttons, all the features inside of it. Uh, we found the online tutorial is uh, really intuitive. So we just use the online, we just introduced the online tutorial in, in our video. I'm not gonna play all of them, it's quite long. Uh, let's skip to the next part. Sorry, my, my computer is a bit slow. All right, here we go. And uh, we also included the materials you're gonna use for different challenges. So we, we're trying to uh, let students to use their toys or stuff at home to get them more interested. All right, so this is some examples we give students to get them inspired. Right, so uh, finally we have the uh, Flipgrid reminder. We want to gather all the students' work on Flipgrid, which is uh, really easy to do for students at home. And here we go. Good luck with your challenge. <coughs> all right. So let me change it back. Yeah, so you know the, the the videos obviously they did take a long time to make because we didn't need to find all that content and make that make those tutorials of also blockly, but we really found that that was that thing that really hooked the students in that got them really excited. Um, even coming back to school when the students hear the music, they you know they start they start dancing a bit because they recognize it from their online challenges. So um, you know a lot of work, but it was it was definitely worth it to get the students involved and engaged. Um, you know, we have a big school, almost a thousand students in primary. The last thing we wanted were, were, was a thousand emails. Not saying that everyone would email, but you know, there'd be a lot of emails from students. Um, so we wanted to set up a support uh, system um, that was nice and easy for students to use. A platform, uh, a platform that's one of our core resources is Padlet. Um, and we use this to facilitate any questions that students had uh, during the challenges, during the setup and so on. Um, so they, we would post, uh, you know, the challenge on the Padlet, as you can see here, challenge one, challenge two, and so on. And then students would just put their, put their question uh, below. The nice thing about Padlet was that um, they, could, they could put their, uh, put a picture, record a video so that they could share exactly what was, what was happening in their home. And then we could solve, we could solve it that way. Uh, and then a lot of the other students, they end up saying, well, you know, we were having the same problem as so-and-so. But we saw in the Padlet that problem was already explained, the, the, the solution. So we used it kind of as like a FAQ section for students to use. Um, this really promoted students to take ownership and um, find out the problems on their own, you know, figure out what is diagnosed, what is their problem, and then post it on here and then find out an answer. We only had maybe a few students for each challenge that had questions. Everyone was was fairly comfortable just because we had given them so much uh, direction and resources. But we found this as a good way rather than email. All right. Yeah, speaking of sharing, so with distance learning, it's, it is challenging to make sure students follow, follow the instructions properly. So, uh, and that's why we put our instructions on Flipgrid and link to our post in Google Classroom. Uh, also, we included links and instructions in each of our instructional videos in order to gather uh, all work in one place. So, uh, all the submission of work is optional, as you can see. 
the amount of engagement was really encouraging. Uh, and I have to say, I was really surprised when I saw this. Okay. Um, so here, you're going to see, just playing in the background, our challenge videos, uh, or sorry, our highlight videos. Uh, they may not run very clearly, but I just want to talk a little bit about why we made them. Um, so to celebrate all of the students' work, uh, because they put all that time and effort in, we made these videos to showcase uh, these Ozobot challenges. So every single video that was submitted on the Flipgrid uh, was at least a small clip was taken and put into the video um, and these videos were then shared out regularly to our school community uh, you know just to celebrate what the students have been doing to showcase their creativity um, and to showcase you know all, all of the hard work and time they put into this um, and you know as one video went out from challenge one it got more more students excited to then participate and share a video for challenge two as you see this mr. Hill showed up there because he actually participated in the challenges, um, which is wonderful. They have, you know, their teacher, one of their teacher mentors, um, you know, creating, uh, creating a, a solution for a uh, mosquito problem in, in his home. I think one, one of them was, uh, but yeah, this, they were a lot of fun to make, you know, we got, we, we made sure that we went through and viewed all the content uh, and then showcased it in this way. Um, and we shared these out on Twitter and we'll make sure that everyone has uh, links to these as well in, at the end of the webinar. Yeah, so just to clarify, at this point and all throughout the unboxing, <clears throat> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, I've got a sore throat today. Um, all throughout this unboxing and the challenges videos, I was not really involved. This is totally new to me. Um, so a lot of the, I know the, a, lot of, a lot of people in the audience are new to us as well. So that, that was me. Um, but this was a, a powerful tool that every single one of my students had access to. Um, so I thought that I should get involved. I, sh I thought that I should show some enthusiasm. So I was just learning alongside them and participating just as a student, um, which I really enjoyed and I was able to learn very quickly because it's not such a difficult tool. Um, I had all the support that I needed. So one of the big advantages and a unique selling point of Ozobot is the offline option. And especially we were a few months into remote learning at this point. So the screen time was an issue and a lot of people were concerned about it. I think the parents really understood why we were doing a lot of work online and you know, I call it necessary screen time. We were trying to keep everybody connected. Um, we wanted the, that collaboration to continue. We tried to balance it with offline stuff as well, but the online stuff was just so much more powerful to keep everybody connected. So when we offered them an offline option for coding, uh, of course, we still brought it together in the highlight videos and Flipgrid, but they really appreciated this offline option. Uh, and that's great that Ozobot offers that. <clears throat> and as you saw from the highlight videos, the creativity was amazing. Um, different children, and we encouraged it as well, children bringing in different toys like Lego and, and all the different figures and the drawing and the crafts. Um, that was really exciting to see. And on all the play that was going on, you know, even with my videos, I was playing at home. Uh, and that's really still very undervalued in schools, I think. We know the value of play, but I don't think it affects our practice enough like it should. And the problem solving as well. With any coding program, there will be problems, there'll be issues along the way. You have to be resilient, you have to solve those problems. And one of the challenges as well was specifically about solving a problem at home. So that was really good to see as well. And the challenges that Ryan and Fred set were deliberately very open. They were not um, aimed at any particular subject or topic. But just from coding, and, and I know from my own experience of doing this as well, is participate, participating. Um, I was using so many skills that the children are learning in school. You know, I was thinking about angles and measurements, and I was thinking about um, video editing and storytelling and art. So even with these open challenges, so much learning is involved. And what, as a teacher, whatever learning outcome I have in mind, there's almost guaranteed to be byproducts learning going on. Um, other things that the children are either reinforcing or learning along the way. And the other thing that was great to see was all the family engagement. You know, it wasn't like the children were in their bedrooms doing it on their own. 
Um, siblings were getting involved, especially siblings who were in the same school. They would have had two or three Ozobots. They were playing together. The parents were getting involved. I know when I was doing it at home, my girlfriend was getting involved. Um, she was helping me out, or interfering, as I called it. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so loads of family engagement. And my, my teaching partner in school um, has a son in year three, and she was telling me how her whole family were getting involved with Ozobot. So that was really great to see. And then some of the challenges of trying to utilize that as well with, you know, make a family member happy, make them smile. We've got a Mother's Day card here and that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Um, so we just want to talk about uh, some next steps for us because we are fairly new with this. You know, we were only about, I guess, three months or so into our journey into, into one to one Ozobot. Um, we really want to use Ozobot as a core resource because, you know, we have now one in the hand of every single child at the school, every student. Um, so some next steps for us, we're going to make sure that we run some upskilling sessions uh, for teachers. We had already been integrating Ozobot into learning for the, pre for the last few years. Um, so we had done a little bit of upskilling, but we wanted to make that more widespread uh, and show different grade levels and the teachers in different grades how this can be applied um, to, the con to their curriculum and the content that they're learning in, the in their grades. Um, we want to work with the department heads, especially math and English, and to show how Ozobot can be a very powerful tool in learning math and in le you know, learning English and e expressing themselves and, and so on. Um, we also are working on some new websites. So we're working on a website for our teachers and we're also working on a website for our students. Um, after coming out of online learning, we realized that uh, you know, we didn't have enough resources for everyone to learn independently. Um, and if, you know, if online learning comes back, um, which it can at any point, we wanna make sure that we are really ready this time. So um, we're gonna be adding all these Ozobot resources onto our um, new websites for teachers and for students um, to support them if they wanna you know, use the Ozobot for any kind of learning at home. And then for students, they want to um, just, you know, work on something on their own uh, using the resources they already have from Ozobot. Uh, and then we also need to explore the Ozobot classroom more. When, while we're looking for more integration ideas, uh, we see new ideas going up there all the time. It's, an abs it's a treasure trove right now of great integration ideas. Uh, I, don't, I don't think we've explored that full enough yet. We, we mainly were using Twitter uh, and YouTube when we were creating the challenges. Um, so this is something we're going to explore further uh, to really strengthen our resources uh, at school. Yeah, um, as an educator, uh, I do believe that the diversity of robots can provide different uh, learning experiences. So some robots might have uh, advanced AI features for older students, while some can give better fundamental learning experience for younger students, and some support block based coding only and some may support uh, text-based coding only. So we actually have different sets of robots in our secondary section. So how we align with our secondary school robo uh, robo robotics curriculum and with a better, smoother transition from other bots to other robots will be a challenge for us. And this is definitely what we want to work on next. And hopefully we can share more about this in future. Yeah, and I'd just like to mention as well, sorry, they've just started drilling next door, so it's not ideal. I'll stay muted for as much as possible. Um, but the bot camp is really great. Um, I already had the learning from Ryan and Fred and all of their great videos, but I was checking out the bot camp just out of curiosity, and that's really good, step by step. Anyone starting with Ozobot, that's a great place to start. And just one hour, you've really got everything covered. Um, so there are some things that you need to consider if you are going to do, you, you utilize a one-to-one -one Ozobot program. I'll obviously budget. I know um, Ozobot is going to talk a little bit about their new um, budgeting plan for how they're going to uh, implement this program in schools. Um, for us, it was, it was really about, uh, you know, because we needed to buy so many devices it was really needed, a, we really needed that affordability, so it met our budget needs within this situation, but I know every situation is different. Um, yeah. 
Uh, and also to, we have to consider the, the professional development of teachers. And I know Ryan mentioned upskilling and offering workshops, but there's also a lot out there for self-learning. The teachers can direct that on their own. Um, as Fred mentioned already, the tutorial of Ozo Blockly is really great, that's step-by-step. -step. The bot camp, all the YouTube videos that are out there and all the great content creators. Um, it's really there already, so you can self-learn and that professional development offered by workshop leaders is just that extra step. And when teachers are really familiar with the product, they know how it works, like any tech, then they can focus on pedagogy and, and making it work best for the classroom. And they can also get connected with other people using the community and take advantage of those existing resources. Right, uh, for the last point, I'd like to use a few questions to put this through. So, uh, this things like how, how, how do you garner uh, excitement in your school around one-to-one audible program? Are you going to create any prom promotional materials or advertisement? Are you going to hold any workshops for your school community, such as teachers or parents' workshops? So what are the strategies to keep the momentum rolling? So especially, especially during this difficult time, we think it's um, very important for students to have the momentum going into learn at home. Right. Oh, okay, I think that's should it. <laughs> and is anything about Adam or uh, Ryan? No, I think that's it. We can give it over to the team. Okay, all right. Yeah. Thank you so much, you guys. Um, I am Adrian from the Ozabot team. I'm gonna follow that up really quickly. So let me share my screen. Um, let's see. So you guys should see that same slide now. Um, Adam, Ryan, Fred, I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to prepare these materials and share them with our community today. We really can't thank you enough. Um, it's really inspiring to see what you've done and the fact that you guys had kind of a jump on us here in the US. Sure. Things happened earlier for you. It's just invaluable information. Um, and I think it'll be interesting to dig into with you guys in the Q&A uh, what it's been like now going back to school because everyone's wondering about that a lot. Um, but yeah, one thing I just wanted to call out and what you shared is those highlight reels. I think clearly you put so much work into the challenges and the whole process, but then taking that time to show off what students were doing um, when you know adults and kids alike have been having a tough time with social distancing and all the adjustments, I think that clearly went a really long way. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so, yeah. Um, so you guys have really inspired us um, and other educators in our community have as well. So there's actually a new program that has launched with Ozabot, our one-to-one -one program. Um, again, inspired by the kind of work you guys have been doing and the ways that educators have innovated, innovated and adapted to this kind of new normal for education. Um, so for those on the webinar who are kind of familiar with Ozobot already, I know that's a good chunk of the audience, you're probably familiar with Ozobot Evo, um, our newest bot, and then how Evo is packaged. So it comes currently in an educator entry kit, um, which is designed to really engage one educator and maybe a couple of students, um, but comes with educator training, that bot camp that Adam mentioned in our two ways to code. Um, and from there, if educators get it, they like it, they want to bring it to their classroom, they can upgrade to a classroom kit. Um, our classroom kits come with 12 or 18 robots really designed to engage a full class of students in a pair programming model. But so with everything that's gone on um, and seeing, again, innovative educators still finding ways to get bots to their students and engage them even at home, we've now introduced this one-to-one -one program. So the way it works and the main difference is that it's actually a subscription model. So for schools and districts, they're buying into a two or a three year plan with us. Um, and it essentially takes the core of what our educator community loves about Ozbot. So specifically those two ways to code and the versatility the two ways to code give us um, and delivers those for hybrid learning. So whether your students are at home or back in school, we want them to be learning and engaged with Ozobot. Um, so just to break down the basics of how it works, each student gets a bot. Um, you can see the packaging right here. It's a nice protective case. 
Um, so we want to make it easy for schools and districts who are distributing Ozobots out to their student populations. Um, and that case also, it houses, of course, the Nozobot Evo, but also the color code markers and charger. Um, for teachers, teachers get access to ready-to-run lessons. Um, the team today talked a lot about Ozobot Classroom, same platform to access those, um, but we're introducing, actually Melissa's spearheading, introducing more and more remote-friendly lessons for this program. Um, and then finally, for schools and districts, also through Ozobot Classroom, you get an ability to track student engagement, even when your students are working at home, which we know engagement is one of the biggest concerns right now, followed by that screen fatigue that everyone's been talking about. Um, one thing I want to highlight, highlight for the districts too, um, since it was a question in the chat, we have a worry-free bot replacement program as part of the one-to-one -one program. So I said two and three year subscriptions. Um, at the start of your second year, we just ship you more bots, 20% of your original cohort of bots. Um, so you don't even have to worry about one student lost their bot, another one broke one, or it's damaged. Um, so we want it to be really seamless and easy for you guys. Um, I mentioned classroom. So like with a classroom kit purchase, um, our one-to-one -one program includes access to Ozobot Classroom. That's where all of that lesson content is. Um, and here I just want to highlight that Within Ozobot Classroom, you get access to lessons for all grades, K to 12, and all subjects. So this actually surprised us. We surveyed our users, and 74% of you guys are already using Ozobot to teach core subjects like math and ELA. Um, so that was great to find out, um, and I'm glad people are using that lesson content. Um, another note about Ozobot Classroom, we're integrating it with Google Classroom. So I also saw in the chat a lot of people are using Google Classroom, so wanted to make that easy for educators as well. You keep using the tools you're already using for remote teaching. Um, this just kind of gives you a high-level overview of what learning with Ozobot looks like in this new normal. So if you go with us for the one-to-one -one program um, in class, you're getting that Ozobot Classroom connection and data, but same thing goes for at-home usage. Um, and then I mentioned that Melissa is working on a remote curriculum. Um, that's going to be primarily, it's primarily going to consist of instructional lesson videos. So if a lot of you are teaching asynchronously right now, um, it's really easy to get assignments out to your students, um, leverage video like the team here did, and yeah, make it seamless and easy for you. And just to note, um, there, Adrian, as well, we're taking all the heavy lifting off of the teachers there. They're, um, we're trying to make it as easy for you as possible. So there won't, there's no expectation for teachers to front load content or do any type of instruction. We're going to take care of that for you so that you can focus on um, your needs in the classroom if you're in a hybrid model or, you know, your direct instruction through your remote teaching. So um, we're making this, we're making STEAM simple for you. So just wanted to highlight that. Yeah, that's the goal. And I should have mentioned that too. Melissa and team are really focusing again on those core subjects to start. So that remote friendly curriculum starts with math and ELA and then gets into broader STEAM subjects, which I think is really smart. And um, they will be um, standards aligned lessons as well. So yes. it's important to note <laughs> that we'll be hitting standards. Um, so again, this program is available in two and three year subscriptions. If any of you are interested in learning more about it for your school or district, um, and you are at a US-based school or district, you can go to this link, ozo.bot slash hybrid, um, or share that with your colleagues and see if it's something that could work for you guys and could be helpful. Um, I know that some schools are thinking about reopening for the fall. Some are looking at more of a hybrid model, and then others are planning to stay remote. So. We wanted to roll out a solution that works for you no matter where your students are and where they're learning. Um, for, I know we have, I think, a pretty good sized international audience too. So we listed a couple of our international distributors here. Um, you can reach out to Marusis if you're Hong Kong based, for example, or we have a distributor in Australia, EdTex. Um, if you're in a different country that's not covered here, you can just email us at hello at ozobot.com. We'll try to get you connected with the right distributor. 
um, so that they can work with you to roll out a program of your own because um, we want to make sure everyone's covered. So, um, but yeah, if you're US-based, we're just doing the pilot program for one-to-one -one right now and we have promotional pricing for that. Um, if you go to that link, ozo.bot slash hybrid, you can get connected with one of our account executives and get a quote um, and get all the details you need to get started. So with that, um, Melissa, should I let you take over? Yeah, now? sure. I think um, we can stop screen sharing just for our Q&A session and then I'll wrap up at the end with the final slides. So um, we got a lot of really great questions in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, something that came up early on, um, someone in the audience asked how common is it for students to lose or break their Ozobots? And while I was thinking about that, you know, I would also love to know if you um, had any strategies for um, setting expectations with your students about like, hey, when you take this bot home, this is what we expect of you and how you treat it, um, just to make sure that, that um, they understand kind of the responsibility of having that bot at home, if that makes sense. Yeah, I can jump in. Um, we already have a one-to-one -one program with Chromebooks and iPads, um, different in different grades, but we've, we've emphasized that already. Well, this is your product, look after it. <clears throat> and you know, we, all, of, all of that is in place already. So I feel that this Ozobot was not, um, was a new product, but we'd had all, all of those conversations previously already. And I'm not aware of, um, I think one I'm aware of in the whole school that, that had a, a breakage. Maybe you guys know more. Yeah, um, there was a, there were a few Ozobots just where the work plugs in we had a few issues, but there was no problem uh, with the distributor and switching, switching those for the students. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have, we have three pillars at the school that we follow with all technology. It's um, respectful, responsible, and accountable. Uh, so that applied with this as well is that you need, you know, this is your, this is your property. It's also, you know, something the school has provided. So it's, it's uh, something very important. So you need to be respectful and hit, be responsible of it. And if anything does happen, um, things do happen, you need to be responsible for your actions. And, and the students know that and they've been following it. So, you yeah. know. Great, thank you. Um, Susie in the audience was, uh, had a question about having students with disabilities. Um, was that something that you, um, you all encountered and how were you able to um, adapt your lessons and accommodate to their learning, learning needs? Well, I think the, the low floor and high ceiling approach was really valuable. You know, not just thinking about different ages, but different abilities as well. Um, so those open challenges that everybody could access but depending on your ability, you could take it however, however far you want to. So we kind of utilize that approach, just like we do in, in other classes. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we, we, we do obviously have students with some differing needs. Uh, and you know, some of them actually did reach out during the, to the support uh, Padlet um, and, and shared some issues that they were having and we facilitated through there. Uh, they sent video, we sent some video back. Uh, and I think, yeah, it was, what wasn't it because we had that off that off screen coding option using the markers it really for the students who really have some difficulty you know picking up those fundamental coding skills that they can at least access it using the, using the marker coding um we definitely covered i think all of our basis and all of our students great thank you um joy is asking did you come up with the challenges or is that something provided by the ozobot company Oh, those are in inspired by the online communities. As I said before, like we checked um, Twitter, we checked the YouTube, we checked the um, um, Audible online community. So there are lots of good ideas around the world. So we just basically cons consolidate the ideas and to adapt to our school context. So it's really like, um, it's, not, it's not really like a very difficult and challenging uh, process. So I think it's, uh, if, if you want to start with that, start with something fundamental and grow it up. Uh, so you can cover basically all the students with different learning um, capabilities. Yeah. Great, thank you. And um, Joy, just to clarify as well, we are creating that one-to-one um, -one curriculum, remote learning curriculum. So there will be supports um, from the Ozobot side as well for you to access and utilize in your own classroom. Um, Nolan was asking, is it possible to develop a content related challenge while still allowing for creativity? Um, as a follow up to, as an example, 
uh, follow up to studying pollination, could students use Ozobots um, to somehow display their learning about the process? Sorry, can you just say that again? Sorry. Yeah, I think he's asking if, um, how, how, how do you allow for structured activities, but still allowing for creative freedom for, for the students? Yeah, it's a good question. I think not just with those boys, but with any kind of creative process. Um, I think just setting the expectation and being clear about the learning goal, but without giving too many, what's the word I'm looking for, without telling them exactly what to do. You know, you express yourself in your own way. This is what I expect, but how, how you get there is up to you. Um, I think that's what I try to do in my classroom. It's almost like a yeah. guided exploration, if you will. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. Nolan, if you want some clarification, feel free to type in the chat if I misinterpreted it's a, it's a, your question. <laughs> it's a good question and a tough question, but yeah. And uh, like with the challenges, we, you know, students accompanied the Ozobot and the markers with so many different things. So leaving it open, let, letting them bring in their creativity, their toys, their costumes that they create, their things that they make out of recyclable materials, their artwork and whatever it was. So even if maybe the challenge is um, kind of specific for, you know, how, you know, what the Ozobot needs to show, they could bring in all these different elements to make it more creative and to bring in their, you know, their interests and their passions uh, in, into their creation. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I actually had a question. I know that um, bilingual education is, you know, relevant here in the United States as well. And I noticed that in your video, it looks like it was Mandarin and English in the direction. So, um, can you talk a little bit about if how the bilingual education element kind of comes into play um, in this content area and in your lessons? Yeah, and I think um, when they were online and they were working from home remotely, um, we put less pressure on that. So the instructions in the video, for example, I believe they were just a translation of each other, um, which is fine because we have different students of different abilities. So we didn't want to put that pressure on them for different languages. We do have some students who are weaker in one, um, but usually we don't translate like that. Normally the instructions are, are, are different things. So you have to kind of understand both. And that's the expectation here. And we have quite a unique, quite famous in Hong Kong bilingual uh, teaching approach. We have two teachers in every classroom, uh, one uh, English speaking, one Chinese speaking, and we co-teach together. Um, so we kind of bounce off each other, um, but in the two languages. So the students are picking up both. And that goes all throughout the primary. That's absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and another consideration for giving like bilingual instructions is the uh, younger learners, like they probably need like parents help um, uh, complete the tasks. So I know some of the parents, they only, they only speak Mandarin, so they, they can only read Chinese. So it's gonna be helpful for them to understand the challenge in order to help their the children as well. So that's another consideration with why we put the bilingual instruction there. Great. Um, somebody in the audience asked about um, what video editing tools or software you use to create the highlight videos. Oh, we, we, we use ScreenFlow, which is a really intuitive uh, ed ed editing software. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a linear um, video editing software, which like uh, you can have lots of flexibility on um, treating the different elements around around your screen. So right now I've been using it, been using it for a while, which is really helpful for making tutorials or some creative videos editing. But also the students were editing their videos before they uploaded them to Flipgrid, right? Um, so we saw a few a few different products there, iMovie quite often, or clips from Matt, Apple as well. Yeah, clips. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, it looks like a couple of people had questions about the one-to-one -one program, mainly along the lines of if I'm a classroom teacher, how can I get you know my class one-to-one -one if the whole school isn't interested? Um, you can still purchase our classroom kits. Those come with either 12 or 18. Ozobots, um, and those are available on our website, ozobot.com. But I do encourage you guys, I mean, even if you're a classroom teacher, you're not sure your school, it's something that they'd be interested in, um, you could put 
our account executives in touch with someone at your school or district and kind of let them do the work for you um, and see if it's something that you know, once we find that when school leadership or district leadership learn that Ozabot can be used to teach all these other subject areas, it's not just coding and computer science, then it tends to open up um, more of a discussion and sometimes more budget. So you can go to that website we shared, ozo.bot slash hybrid, and nominate your school or district there, and then just put that account executive in touch with someone at your school or district. All right, great. And with that, I know um, we have educators eager um, to get to the giveaway. So we're going to do some wrap up. Can, can everyone see my screen with the slide on it? Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. Um, so if you're in the audience and you're looking for more of those integration ideas or just want to connect with other educators that um, are familiar with Ozabot, feel free to join our Ozabot Academy Facebook group. Um, let's see. Uh, if you are interested in getting a professional development certificate, um, you can email support at ozabot.com. Um, if you want to re-review this, uh, this, this webinar, um, it will be posted up on our YouTube channel the next couple days. And um, if you want to get an email with this recording and the slides, um, you can opt in for updates on our website. If you scroll all the way down to the bottom, there's a field for you to um, put in your email address and you'll get emailed um, all our webinar updates. So um, I'm going to put up um, all of the Twitter handles for Adam, Fred, and Ryan. So if you have any specific questions for them, feel free to reach out on Twitter. And so with that, we're going to move on to our giveaway. And actually, to truly randomize it, I'm going to ask our guests to pick a number. Um, they, did, they did not know that I was going to ask them to do this, so we'll truly randomize it. Um, if Let's start with uh, Ryan. Ryan, could you pick a number between two and 27? Let's see, my birthday is on May 9th, so let's go with the 9th. All right. Um, I think Cassandra will be uh, um, helping yeah. us figure out the winner there. Number nine, we have Kathy Jarrett. Congratulations. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, great. And uh, Fred, would you like to pick a number that is not nine, but between two and 29? <laughs> or 27, I'm sorry, between two and 27. All uh, right, uh, I will go with six because six is a lucky number in Chinese culture. I like that. Awesome. I'm sorry if I butcher the last name, but we have Jenny McLaughlin. Oh, cool. McLaughlin. Is that McLaughlin? <laughs> yes. Congratulations. All right. And then last but not least, Adam, if you could choose a number between two and 27. Well, to honor this challenging year, let's go for 2020, number 20. Oh, great. We have Allison Sander. Congrats, Allison. All right, and we will be reaching out um, to you, to the winners, um, just to get your information so that we can get those educator entry kits to you. Um, I, again, I want to thank uh, Fred, Ryan, and Adam for joining us today. Again, they're in Hong Kong, and we just so very much appreciate them taking their weekend to get up early and share with us. Um, we, I know I learned so much today, and I'm inspired to gr create some really great content for students to, you know, start learning, start enjoying learning again, because I know it's been super tough for not only teachers and students. Um, so we really appreciate you taking the time. We hope everyone stays safe and healthy and hope everyone has a really wonderful weekend. So thank you. Thanks, you guys. Thank, thank you. you. It's our pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. 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 Have a great weekend. Yeah, you thank too. You. Thank you.